if you know, but we are meeting just a few days before the World Communications Day. I don't know if you know about such day. It exists, and every Sunday just before the Pentecost, we celebrate um, this day, so this year, uh, May 29th. It's coming soon. And uh, this World Communications Day was um, established by Paul, Paul VI in 1964. Five, seven, seven, to encourage us to reflect on communications, on media, uh, to try to think about the opportunities and the challenges that motion pictures, well, back in the days, radio, well, maybe even now, radio, television, now the internet, all those challenges and uh, opportunities that they offer, and somehow to reflect whether those means of communication can help us can we use them to promote um, uh, to promote gospel uh, values? So today, I'm very happy that we have this opportunity to reflect a little bit on motion pictures, on movies, and to think about how to watch, what to watch out for as we watch, and how to read while we watch. So this is basically the main theme of our. Um, meeting today. Uh, a, a question that I would like to ask you is not whether you watch movies, because I assume that <laughs> we all do, so that's not a fair question, unless you want to say that I'm, 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 I'm out of uh, visual media. Uh, but my question to you is, why do you watch movies? In what circumstances do you watch movies? Like, when do you decide, okay, it's time for a movie, a serious binge-watching Netflix, whatnot, so no. <laughs> I say just kind of when I'm bored and I'm like, I need a break from schoolwork or, mm -hmm. you know, just like <coughs> to relax. Like, often I watch a familiar movie that I've seen. Uh-huh. And really, like, chill and like, Exa uh -huh. not overthink my assignments. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, often when I, um, want to enjoy, if it's a rewatch of a movie or a TV show that I've already seen, it's to enjoy the story that uh -huh. I've seen and to engage with the story. Uh -huh. And then for a new movie or a new TV show, I'll usually only watch something if I've got like a general idea of what it is okay. or I've had people recommend it to me. Okay, to be um, able to enjoy it somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like watching with friends and like, on, if we're not in the same place, it's something that we like to do together. Like we'll be on the phone talking while we watch a movie nice. or a TV show together. Nice. I see why I'm not to bed. Uh -huh. Because it's like normally just, it's something you like kind of like, subconsciously listen to. Mm -hmm. It's just like, pass out. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, in a way, I think that if we just put this question in a survey, a very, a, 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 an answer that we would get very often would be for the sake of entertainment, in my leisure time. <laughs> And it's very interesting if we think of the concept of leisure, because like, what is really leisure? Uh, if we trace back the roots of the word and the meaning of the word leisure in Greek, so the meaning of the word uh, leisure in Greek is scola. Uh, in Latin, well, in Greek, scola, in Latin, scola, in English, school. So that's... <laughs> Challenge. I mean, that's somehow strange, no? But it, it makes sense if we think deeper about this because uh, the, the purpose of leisure is somehow to educate us, to somehow give us the spa space for um, contemplative activities, to pull uh, ourselves from the busyness and pace of everyday life, uh, to have this time that will help us somehow foster insights and better understanding of who we are, where we are in life. And somehow the word leisure and the, and the connotations that it has in, the, in, in um, its Greek and Latin counterparts uh, also works nicely with the, the, the roots of the word entertainment. Entertainment from French entretenir. Somehow, like back still in the 15th century, it would it would mean um, 
keeping someone or keeping yourself in a certain frame of mind. So um, uh, it, it, it would uh, have this connotation with um, uh, sticking together, supporting being together. So the time of entertainment, the time of leisure is to support, to give um, structure in a way to our life. And if you think and we go back to the book of Genesis and, uh, the uh, and the story of creation. The story of creation doesn't end on the sixth day when the busyness of creation ends, but it is completed by the seventh day. And uh, the seventh day is needed to stabilize the whole um, uh, construction. Uh, we are in the need of this day, and Kuba is coming to say a few more words about the creation story and the seventh day. Okay, so um, a recurring pattern in the Bible is that six is the number where all the work is done, and then the completion only takes place after the seventh part. Um, you could see that in the creation of the world, of course, where, where um, God rested after six days of work. But you can also see it in many um, rules for the Israelites to have a, like a feast every seventh day and then a, every seventh year and, and so on and so forth, right? So this is, this is how it works um, in the world that nothing is completed just after those six days of work. Like there's not only work in life. If there was only work in life, those six days, we would live in a, let's say, a totalitarian system. And it works, and it works from, like, it works on every level of reality, starting from even, like, the basic, we need a day of rest. We cannot go to work seven days a week and, and never rest, right? But then it also works on, on higher levels. And you could also actually argue that if you consider the world as a six-day reality, then Jesus is coming to set us free from this totality of death, from, from, from the death of the world. Because the, the, the world is, is like the earthly, or everything that is earthly is, ends in, in death. And when you have the seth, seventh day, so we could say that, that God... And Jesus acts in the seventh day. So he, he sets us free. He's, a, he's the one who sets us free. And, and the seventh day, the day of reformulation, the day of recovery, is the one which gives us life. There's life in that seventh day. That's right. So Jesus tells us, oh, it actually works. <laughs> Jesus tells us, come to me. All you who are weary, and I will give you rest. So rest, yeah? It's, a very, it's, it's great that in, in English it, 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 is, it is a really great word that works fantas fantastically. Because rest is the thing that is left, or left after you've done something. This is the rest. But it's also recovery, rejuvenation, the rest. That you, and it's actually both of those meanings that work here perfectly. So the seventh day is like the rest of the week. And if, if we only had a work in our life, no leisure, no, uh, no, no free time, then culture wouldn't happen, right? Because all the culture happens in the, in the, at the time where we don't work. Because work, there's no room in the, in the days that we work for culture. And at this point, we could refer you to a German uh, philosopher, Josef Heber, who said, and, well, that's the title of his book as well, Leisure as the Basis of, um, of Culture. So entertainment is this time uh, when we learn how to be. And with saying this, we're slowly approaching the main topic of our uh, meeting today, um, uh, movies. So we defined uh, why we watch movies. We defined what is a possible, what are possible understanding of entertainment and, and leisure time. And somehow if we, if we 
shift if we change our frame of mind, if we start thinking about our leisure time in a new way, it might prove to be more, um, uh, more fruitful. So, leisure and entertainment as time to, uh, to grow, as time which helps us uh, to see uh, meaning. So now, having established this, let us answer the question, why movies matter? And with this, we would like to make three claims. Movies matter because they tell a story, and of course, they tell a story through words and images. Uh, our lives are narratives, that's claim number two. And our third claim would be we model, we model our lives on the stories that we hear, see, follow. And now just to say a few words um, uh, on those uh, three claims. What is this storytelling? Uh, I think that intuitively we somehow get the, whole, the, the idea that as human beings we are inclined to um, communicate via stories. Yes, and the storytelling would be making patterns out of facts. Um, storytelling or stories give unity and order to our life, and otherwise we would just have a number of diverse um, experiences and actions somehow unintelligible. So storytelling help us to um, give unity and order to um, our lives. And it also holds our experience together. And very soon you will experience this. So in a few weeks you go back to, uh, uh, to your families and they ask you, so how was it, how was it? And then probably you won't just give them a list of places that you visited. Day one, Dernstein, sunny weather, right? Uh, you will put your experience into a narrative and somehow, the, the, the more time you leisurely spend, and basically, if we go back to the word of the word leisure, like three weeks here is, is pure leisure for you. <laughs> like the school here, just summer holidays now. Um, uh, uh, if, if, if you are able to reflect on what happens here, um, uh, what, hap what happens to you and how you experience Austria and, um, uh, and, and Europe, you will definitely emphasize certain things rather than others. You will interpret um, uh, some of the events, some of the things that happen to you. Uh, you will try to see how the places, things, things, people affected you, how they changed you. And you will notice that actually what you are telling is not your time in Austria, but your journey of, of self-discovery. And the way you have grown uh, here over those several weeks that you um, spent in um, uh, in Europe. So, um, the journey of self-discovery at some point needs to be brought to language, to this narrative discourse. And the more you're able to do this, the more somehow coherent your life is to yourself. Does this make sense? Yes? Um, and if it's not coherent, if somehow you feel that your life does not have any plot, then the threat of you know, lack of meaning in your life becomes so prevalent and like depression is just around the corner because you just cannot make sense of the story of your own um, uh, life. And if we follow this way of thinking, we can see ourselves as characters in a story or, on di or in different stories. And we can begin to see um, how different stories also affect um, uh, our lives. So, we model our lives on stories, that was our third claim, and other stories influence our stories. Um, and this is interesting because, well, you are familiar with the term mimesis, right? Uh, art uh, imitates life. Right? But there is also this term of anti-mimesis, which flips uh, this definition. And it, o Oscar Wilde was famous for saying that it is uh, life that imitates art, that art somehow uh, opens new ways of experience, and in this way we grow as human beings. So in a way we could say that we are somehow in between those two movements, the movement of mimesis where uh, narrative, the narrative of our life, um, sorry, that nar narrative imitates life and 
um, uh, what were uh, life imitates narrative, where art imitates life, or life imitates um, uh, art. And if we go back to the roots of literature, that was basically the whole uh, idea behind uh, epics, right? How art may influence life of individuals. So the, 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 the very first um, epics, so the oldest genre, you have the code of patterns and behavior. What do I do? Do I, um, uh, uh, do I really understand the value of self-sacrifice? Am I ready to sacrifice myself for a lesser friend, like in the end Achilles did? Um, the power of forgiveness. So those stories were offering certain patterns of behavior, and they were codifying the most important uh, virtues, uh, values of certain cultures um, to help um, the members of those societies learn and grow into good citizens, good human beings. And like this, it's very um, uh, well visible when you think of uh, fables and fairy tales. Basically, it's the same role, no? Because what do fables and fairy tales do? They offer certain patterns of behavior, but much more clear, right? In a, in a fable, uh, good is rewarded and <coughs> evil is punished. And it's made clear so that children, but also adults, finally, we understand. And again, uh, I think that intuitively, if you go, if you go, you, you, you all just get it. Like, if you go back to the time of childhood, like, how many characters in your life did you imitate? Right? I can tell you, or we can tell you, like, hundreds of backyard stories where where our kids just uh, feel this backyard, and at, one, at some point they are ninjas. At other points we have Harry Potters um, uh, uh, and Snapes. We have moms and dads, and we see, sometimes it's nice, sometimes not so much, how they model <laughs> their idea of family on what we represent. Um, sometimes we have the stories of saints. I don't even, I cannot even tell you like how, how often and how many times they retell the whole, uh, the whole narrative of, of the passion, right? And once there was just this beautiful moment, the girls were just wearing dresses, like long dresses and veils. And I don't remember who, but they were asked like, oh girls, so what are you doing? And the girls answered like, we are getting married. And you know, the person asking, uh, was it Javier, was it right? I don't remember. Anyway, so we were hoping you, you know, to, to learn like, who the, are they going to marry? Is this, is this one of the boys in the community? Like, what are the gossips here? So the question goes like, who are you going to marry? And they say Christ. So basically they enacted like the whole, st <laughs> the, the stories of like, of, of the the, that's the difficult word for a Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mystical marriage <laughs> with Christ putting on their face. We were shocked and silence was our response, basically. Uh, but such uh, child's children's play is uh, what we call the hero enactment, right? Um, uh, we align our moral values to the moral values represented by a chosen hero. And it works for kids, but it also works for us on a more conscious or subconscious uh, level. We can approach the, this, the same idea from a different perspective when we begin to think of uh, Fidex uh, uh, ex auditu. Uh, faith comes by hearing, by hearing of the word of Christ, by hearing the, uh, the stories of uh, conversions, the stories of uh, somebody else's growth in faith. And those stories model our narratives. They change and influence us very visibly, like they tell the truth. So um, the change is very tangible. And um, uh, those of you who are familiar with St. Augustine's Confessions, as a genre and as a narrative construction, he does a beautiful thing because he takes, uh, when he talks about the climax of his conversion, he places his conversion among the uh, among other stories of conversion. So his conversion comes uh, and is interlocked with other stories of conversion. And if you 
just follow them back. You, you can follow them to St. Paul, who was very important for uh, Augustine himself. And you get this series of conversions from St. Paul through different other characters, his friends, and finally Augustine himself and his friend who happened to witness his conversion. And in a way, that's the this, this story of Christianity, those stories of, um, uh, of conversion. Um, and now, um, through literature and through movies, um, culture uh, produces narrative models which are presented to us, of course, in a more or less direct um, way. And very often, our lives may become models, uh, may become variants of such um, uh, models. Uh, a Scottish poet, Edwin Muir uh, um, entitled his autobiography, The Story and the Fable. And basically, as he was writing his autobiography, um, uh, um, he, he somehow assumed that we live our individual lives and they are stories, but each life is modeled upon the life of a man. And this is the fable, man with capital M, a timeless story and archetype. Um, at this point, I would like to very shortly refer to uh, a Nobel lecture presented by a Polish Nobel uh, laureate in literature, literature Olga Tokarczuk, um, back in uh, 2019. Um, she presented a lecture entitled um, The Tender Narrator. And it's a very interesting and thought-provoking lecture, though. Um, I don't agree with everything uh, that she says, and basically like, her point was to defend the written wor wor word. And, he, and today we, we will be talking, and we, well, we are talking about um, uh, movies. But she makes several interesting points, which uh, I think can be help helpful in our discussion. Uh, to quote her, the world is a fabric we weave daily on the great looms of information, discussion, films, books, gossip, little anecdotes. And um, we are responsible for the stories that we weave out of those information. And it's getting more and more difficult because we are just bombarded with, um, with those information. And um, uh, she continues by saying that stories are not just aesthetic objects, that um, stories, and here when I say story, I also think uh, movies which present stories, um, they can become powerful tools, very powerful tools. And she goes on saying, he who weaves the story is in charge. He who weaves the story is in charge. She says, she says the historians know it and the tyrants, they know it. And when you think of movie and um, John Paul II um, uh, in his letters um, issued on um, Communications Day, um, he emphasized also um, how influential um, movies may be. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's needless, I mean, needless to say, they can condition the choices <coughs> of, um, uh, uh, of the public. And the more we should somehow give our reflection to the movies because they have such a wide reach and um, in a way, this, this is a very democratic um, uh, tool. And in a way, the greater awareness of the mechanisms that are used by the movies, the greater our control um, uh, is. And we, I think, are called to be responsible um, for being aware of those types of narratives which are offered by pop culture, by uh, movies, by, by TV series, because they create new fables, they create new narratives, they shape our now and they also try to shape our future. And it would be good to somehow know this ahead before we find ourselves in a story that we don't want to, um, that we don't want to uh, be. And now it's time for Cuba. Uh, and he will uh, tell you a few words about um, the greatest story of all and then illustrate what we've set <coughs> up until now with direct references to different movies. Okay, so have, has any one of you ever heard about Joseph Campbell? Yeah? You're familiar with this. 
this name. So, so he wrote this, this book, The Hero's Journey. The, um, so he looked at like hundreds of or t thousands of stories across different cultures in the world. And he noticed a recurring pattern that is always like, you can distill one idea from all of them, that they look almost, all of them have the same structure. Now the thing is that, okay, let's assume that there was no Illuminati <laughs> back in the days, like thousands of years ago, and they didn't tell everyone what stories they should write, and somehow those stories are still kind of the same. Like there was no overarching power. And so why, why do stories look like that? Why there is always a struggle involved? Why is there always an imperfect hero? Someone who is not perfect from the beginning, but they have some faults, some vices that they have to overcome to reach the goal. Now, it, it is like that everywhere in the world because this story just works. <laughs> we find it adequate, we find it truthful, right? There's truth to this story. This is how we experience the world. We are imperfect, we have to struggle, but if we struggle, and if, we're, um, if we are honest, if we give our 100%, then some good can come out of it. We can slay the dragon, we can find the treasure, and come back and share it with the village, right? So this is what stories used to be. And just to, before we move on to, to, um, to particular movies, um, just a short recap, because I, I didn't listen to my wife, sorry, because I couldn't hear it. Um, so once again, we communicate meaning in the world through stories. That's why stories are so important. Because if we just had a bunch of facts, a bunch of things in the world, we need to give them meaning. Like we wouldn't get any meaning out of them, of, of just things being in the world. We need a story to communicate meaning. And stories also tell us how to act in the world. Because we, we don't know what to do in the world unless we have a story that we can um, model our lives on. We also look at our lives as stories, right? When you think of your future, for example, of your dreams that you have, you think of a narrative. Like you become a person, and this is how you become that person, and this is what you do, and this is how it all plays together. So you see meaning in your life, because if you don't see meaning in your life, um, a mild depression is the slightest thing that might happen if you don't see your life as a, as a plot of a, let's say, a movie or something else, like a narrative. If you don't see your life as a narrative, that one thing leads to another, and they somehow all, all make sense together, then your life falls apart, and you're either depressed or you go crazy, right? Now, recently, um, some people started thinking that maybe this, this is too boring and we should play with that a little bit. That's one thing. And also, like, since um, stories, and particularly movies tonight, tell you how to act, someone found out that, okay, so if movies tell people how to act, then maybe if we make particular movies, they will tell them to act in a particular way. So this is what you can learn from some of the uh, modern movies. You're probably too young for that, but this is James Bond, old James Bond. And I think yesterday on, or on Nine Gag, I saw an, um, a whole compilation of different James, James's Bonds. <laughs> um, slapping women <laughs> in the face or in the butt, right? Um, so. He is modeled as a mm, kind of an ideal gentleman of sorts. So, <laughs> so if, this, if, if this series of movies tells you that an ideal gentleman that is always classy, always wins and is always good, is to, that to be an ideal gentleman is to 
slap women and <laughs> mistreat them, then <laughs> you better watch out, right? Now, the thing is that um, once you're mature and you know about those things and you know that um, stories influence you, you have some more protection against such narratives. And you know that there is another narrative that works better than this one. Um, but if you're a child, so that's about your future. Now, you see, quite often you see the outrage, because I don't know, for example, Harry Potter or, or other things, like you see people outraging about things like that. Um, but they, they, they say that, oh, these things have bad influence on children, stuff like that. But we need to know how these things happen. It's not like there's Satan hidden somewhere in, in, in the movie that if you touch the movie, then you, know, you can get possessed or something. Um, I mean, maybe in a, in a figurative way. <laughs> but um, there are movies, and they tell you some things. And there are um, good sides to things like let's say, the, 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 the battered Harry Potter. There are great things about it that teach you great things about how to act and, and about life. And there are movies and there are aspects of every, almost every movie that teach you some other things, right? So, <laughs> you can learn, for, from, for example, uh, in, from Disney movies that if you... <coughs> If you have a problem, or if you have, uh, there's something on your conscience, right? There is some trouble going on within you. Maybe there's some evil within you. So what, what should you do if there's evil within you? Sing about it. <laughs> That's right, you should let it go, right? <laughs> Sing about it and let it go. So, Frozen is, is a beloved movie. Many people love it. I understand that. It's great. But it also has this um, aspects to it that, I mean, you might want to think about them, right? I'm not saying that um, you cannot read that in a way that is fruitful and good, but it also can be read in a way that, okay, so if there's something troubling, there's something wrong going on, just let it go and don't care about it, right? I don't know if anyone has seen this movie. It's an anime. It's newer. Yeah, that's weathering with you. So, <laughs> long story short, um, this character wants to sacrifice herself by the end of the movie to save the world from the flood. But this guy decides that um, his feelings are more important than that sacrifice of hers and doesn't let her. And the world floods. And that's how the movie ends. Oh my gosh, really? Yep. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the spoilers. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> yeah, so I was quite shocked when I watched that. And, you know, you could see this movie as a... So you need to, like, learn to focus. Because what the movie proposes is that the love between them was so strong that they couldn't let it go. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, oh yes, there was there was a very romantic music, and and as you can see, the imagery is also very like vivid and and really gets you into this tunnel of thinking that oh, it's such a great thing that is going on right now. But you need to try to learn to see behind that that the world is just flooding right now yeah. because she he wouldn't let her sacrifice herself for that. <laughs> so, um, some other movies can teach you that um, if you're in pain and if you're suffering, it's okay to enslave a whole city of people. <laughs> and, it's not, <laughs> and it's not that bad. I mean, we can understand you that you did that, right? So, the thing is that, um, again, if you have compassion for, for Wanda here, you can understand her pain and you can see that she is suffering and she, that, uh, that she lost a loved one. But the, 
what 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 it, what comes out of the movie as the end and as the end message is that thus that's okay for her to do it i mean if you, if you want to save your face and your friends to remember you it's okay to rip the world apart and let the multiverse people flow in. It's the newest, that, this is the newest Spider-Man movie. Sorry for more spoilers. <laughs> this should have started with the spoilers. Sorry, spoiler warning. Too late. Um, again, um, it's a good thing to have friends. and It's a good thing to care for those friends and to even have a beloved one and, and love her and let yourself let yourself be loved by them. But there is a hierarchy of goals and there's a hierarchy of what's right and what's wrong. And this movie tells us that those friends and, and your comfort having those friends is more important than the world itself. So I, I, I guess you can see a recurring pattern here with this one, this one, and this one. It centers you on yourself. Not, not, on the, not on your duty, for example, not on the things that are above you, because you're the top of all the things in the world. Oh, yeah. Now, some other movies... Um, again, some other movies can show you that um, the, 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 all the struggle part of this, uh, of, the, of this character arc, as they call it, of the hero's journey is unnecessary that you don't really need to struggle too much because you're perfect the way you are, right? <laughs> now, again, there is some merit to it because you, you shouldn't be um, thinking that you're useless. You should be able to appreciate yourself. You are a child of God. So you are a being that has something to do with the divine. We are divine in a way. But again, there's a hierarchy of those things. Now, have you seen this, this movie? So this is Wonder Woman, first part. Now, sometimes we can see all the things that, that I, I just talked about. We can see them directly in the character of the, of the person, of the protagonist. So it's, it's easy to, to spot, it's easier to spot about, the, about them because of the way they act. But sometimes we need to um, look at symbols. And this is a, a very symbolic scene, mm -hmm. like visual symbolism, for example. And we, we have a, some very strong visual symbolism in this scene. So there's a bad guy, a sniper, in the uh, bell tower of a church. And Wonder Woman has to save her pals, pals, her friends, by jumping on that church and destroying that tower. And then after the tower is destroyed, she emerges on top of it as the top piece of that, right? So, as, so she replaced, we can, we can read that as she replaces God by herself. Right? She is the new pinnacle of everything. But that's, that's, that's Wonder Woman. But then we have a movie like Moana, which is, this is, the, this is actually symbolically identical scene as the other one. <laughs> Cause, um, so have you seen that movie? More or less know what, what this is about. Each um, leader of the tribe of the village sets a next stone on top of the, the previous ones. So we can see this pillar as their history, their culture, uh, their ancestors, the, the, the wisdom of the past, let's say. And each of these stones brings, brings the island closer to heaven. Now, Moana becomes the leader and puts a shell on top of that pillar instead, which means that 
You cannot put anything else over it. That's the top, that's the end. That's the end of the history of this um, village, tribe, island. Well, up to you. <laughs> now, not to torment you with more movies, I think I, I made a point. Um, the question is how to act or how to react to things like that. If you notice that something is either or overtly or underlyingly tell, telling you a story that there is, that maybe you shouldn't, <laughs> you, you wouldn't wish to follow, let's say. So we have, we have those outrage cra crowds that always like, um, start reacting very harshly to things that are not necessarily even that bad actually, but that doesn't matter. Um, my suggestion would be to not act at all, but also not talk about it. Don't draw attention to that. Because if you start talking to other people about it, this is what I just did <laughs> with you. <laughs> if you start um, drawing attention to particular movies, then um, yeah, they, get, they, they have more power because they become automatically more popular. Now, it's not that we should fear those things, but what's important is that we understand what is going on in these movies and the patterns that they, that they display. Now, <laughs> um, some, something for discussion, actually, because uh, Kasia and I disagree on this topic. If we should like react by making um, good Christian movies instead, and there's been so much uh, talk about that. So many people say that we should make better media, we should make um, better movies. Um, and we wonder what what's your idea? Maybe after you share a few thoughts what shall be done, if, if this is a good way to, to act, then maybe Kasia and I will tell you our thoughts about that. Okay, so who's first? <laughs>